So you want to learn how to program. If you follow us through these tutorials, you will gain a new understanding that you've never had before. That is the ability to create whatever you want, whenever you want, and mostly for free. If you were going to build a house and you need to buy lots of materials and you need to buy all the materials for that house and each house that you build and the mistakes that you make, they cost money because it's physical stuff. Mistakes in programming can cost money, especially if you have a boss, but while you're learning, they will only net you lots of extra learning. When you write code, you don't always need to buy stuff. And especially with Python, you very rarely need to buy anything. A lot of times programming is free, except for the cost of a computer, of course. And your program doesn't just have to live inside of a computer. I've written programs that have lived inside beauty shops or go into machines that build stuff for 3D. You may be thinking to yourself that you want to build some sort of app or a website. Well, Python is the perfect thing to do that. In order to do this, we need to pick at least one programming language for you to speak. You need to learn at least one language. So what programming language should we choose? And what is a programming language? So depending on the thing you want to do, you might be better off choosing a specific language. So for example, if you want to build websites, inside of the machine that you're watching this video on right now, there are a gajillion things happening. Gajillions. That's one with a bazillion zeros. Your computer is sending information to your hard drive to write files, to display tiny pixels on the screen, and do tons and tons of other stuff in there, even when it's not making any noise and it's probably still doing tremendous amounts of stuff. In fact, that's the thing that computers are really, really good at, doing things over and over and over again. They never get tired. They never say, no, I don't feel like doing that. They're mind-blowingly good at counting to very high numbers. They're good at remembering large amounts of stuff, and they're good at remembering things forever, like insanely large amounts of stuff. They're good at communicating with other computers very quickly, but they're not so good at other things. They're not really good at understanding human emotion quite yet and speaking and responding exactly like other humans. This series, I'm gonna use the Python programming language. The Python programming language has been around for a very long time. It's a very stable language. Currently, in order to write code for Python, you can use your plain text editor of any choice and you just have to have Python installed. If you don't have Python installed because you're using Windows, then I'll show you how to do that. If you have Mac, you open up your terminal by typing terminal or you can use iTerm, they're both the same thing. In the command, you just type Python, and that will open up your Python interpreter. If you're using Windows, I'll show you how to do that. So let's get started. If you have Windows, I'll show you how to get started with Python. You just need to start up your Windows machine. You can open up your command line by pressing Start and typing CMD. If you type Python in here, and it tells you that it's not recognized, then you know you don't have Python installed. So open up your internet. You wanna to go to python.org, click downloads, and you wanna download Python 2.7.8, and you're just gonna install it and finish. So now you should have Python installed, and if we were to restart our command line, it probably still won't work because we need to probably create the path. CD will get you into different directories, so you wanna see if Python should be installed in the C directory when you do this. So if you type dir, D-I-R, you should see Python 2.7. So you've got python.exe in your Python 2.27 directory. So all you have to do is set your environmental variables. So you can type set python path equals percent python path percent semicolon C colon backslash python 2.7. Now you can type Python and it works. So you're all set to go with Python on your Windows machine. If you're using a Mac, again, you already have Python installed. So you're probably starting from scratch. So I'll tell you that all the code that you write always goes in some sort of plain text editor. When you think of writing plain text, you probably think of writing a Word document. We're gonna use a plain text editor to write our Python code. There's a couple of free ones. You can use brackets or atom. So if you open up your internet and type brackets.io, then you can download this for Windows or for Mac, or you can use atom.io. And you can see that you can install that for Windows and you can install that for Mac as well, pretty simply. So those are both free. So open up, let's use atom for right now. And 
I'm going to open up a Word document. You can see that this Word document looks nothing like what I probably wrote in the Word document. That's because when Microsoft stores your file, they have a way of saying, this is bold, that's italics, and stuff like that. Only Word can open up that type of file because it knows how to read it. We can open it up too, but we just don't know how to read it. Just like those slideshows in the old Viewmasters, those Viewmasters were meant to hold only those slideshows, just like Word is meant to read this specific type of file, a doc file. You can try this out with a PNG, or you can try it out with a JPEG, and you'll see the same thing, because only certain things are meant to read PNGs and turn it into an image. What we're going to do is we're going to write plain text, and something that's going to take the code we write and turn it into something that the machine can read. Specifically, Python will do that for us. What we're going to do is we're going to open up a new file. This whole process of taking the words we write and turning it into something the machine can read is called compiling. Now Python does not need to be compiled because the Python interpreter, what Python uses to read your code, reads it just as you wrote it. Some other languages need to be compiled and turned into special types of code, but Python is not that way. Each word we type does something different. Some words are going to be for naming things to use later, like how you write your name on a cup if you're at a party so you know which cup is yours, or how they give you a sticker with your name on it that says, hello, my name is, and the people can identify you. You could say that the different things we write can do different types of things. One of the easiest things you can do is to store stuff on the computer. It's even faster than saving a Word document, and it takes up much less space. Let's save the number five for later use. And if this number five was a cup at a party, you would write something on it to identify it, like number five written on the cup. So let's give this five a name to identify it. So let's write the word five, and we'll say is equal to the number five. We have to save this. Let's save it into our documents as first.py. That dot pi will tell Adam that this is a Python file, and you can see that stuff starts changing colors. In order to use this on a Mac and on a PC, you need to open up that file with Python. So you can type Python and then the name of the file. You need to use the absolute path of the, f of the file. So in Windows or Mac, you can CD into the right directory. CD changes the directory you're currently in. So I'm currently in users slash Skip Wilson. So I'll go to CD documents. And then in there, you can see that I have my first.py. So if I want to run this while in that first.py directory, I can type Python first.py. And it ran it, but it didn't do anything because you can see that I'm now back to the terminal again. In order to make this do something, we have to make it print something. So we can say print five. And you can see that we actually stored the number five in this word, otherwise known as a variable five. So a variable means that you're going to store something. So now we have a variable five, which is storing in memory the number five. If we change this to six and we go back to our terminal, we press up to go to the last command and we press enter. We'll run this again and we can see that five now prints six because we have the variable five storing the number six. This word five isn't a very good name for this. This is a little confusing because five now stores six. We need something more generic. Let's use the word number to store six. Now we'll print five and let's see what happens. We're going to get an error because five no longer exists. We changed it to the word number. So we need to also print number down here. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So we're storing the number six in the variable number and then we're going to print what's stored within number. So now that prints out the number six. It looks like it found it, so it's giving you back the thing that it's stored. So all is well and good, but it doesn't really do much. Six is a number. When I was in first grade, I learned that you can add numbers together. Let's give this a try. So if we want to print something, we could print six plus six. Let's see what happens. We press up and enter and we get 12. Now what about our number? This is storing the number six for us. We can think of it as number is the number six. We should be able to just use it like our number six above. Let's give that a try. So we can do print number plus six. We go back to our command line, we press up 
enter, and we get 12 again because number is stored as the number six. We can think of this as being the number six. We just stored a number and used it later to add to a different number. Does that make sense? I think it should. I want to show you something really cool. Computers don't just have to store stuff. They can, of course, make decisions. I want to show you how to ask the computer a question. We use two different things here that are going to be very similar. We use this one equal sign here, which means that number is being assigned to six. It means that you're saying number should be six. That equal sign is assigning number to six. What we can do is we can use a double equal sign and that will ask the question, does number equal six? And the compiler is gonna say yes or no in the way that compilers say yes or no. So does number equal six? Well, up here we can see that it does. Let's run this again. And you have to save this every time, otherwise it won't work. Hit up, hit enter, and you can see that it printed back true. So number does in fact equal six. So these double equal signs, that means does number equal six. We asked the question and we got an answer. So the big difference between the single equal sign and the double equal sign is that you can use the double equal sign to ask the computer if one thing is equal to the other one. The single equal sign means this is equal to the other one. It's setting it, it's assigning it. So let's try another question. Does number equal eight? Well, does number equal eight? No, number is equal to six. So let's see what happens when we run it. Save it, press up, enter, false. So number does not equal eight. Our question got reevaluated and suddenly that number is not equal to six anymore. You're rocking it out, nice job. You're going to be working at NASA in no time. Now, our only problem is that we've been working in numbers up to this point. So if you want to say, write something to the screen like game over, um, you'd be out of luck because we only know numbers right now. You could write three, two, one to the screen, which could mean game over, but we won't do that. So how could we save words and characters to the screen? Well, let's see what happens if we just change our example above and rewrite it. So if we take number and change it to the word word, and instead of six, we write hello. And down here, instead of printing number, we're going to print our word. Let's see if it works. We press save it, we press up, we press enter, and it gives us an error. Hello is not defined. That didn't work. Why did it not work? Because you just wrote hello, and that's as if you're telling the computer about a variable. We need a way to say that this isn't the name of a variable, but it's an actual word or a string. That's what we call text in programming, a string. We need a way to say that this is going to be a string. Hello is going to be a string. To do this, we can use the double or single quote marks. So you put a double quote on one side and a double quote on the other. You can see that it changed colors and that means that it's working. And now if we save it, press up, press enter, run it again, you can see that this time it did print out hello. So it works. It didn't throw an error. We've stored a couple of things in memory and we've printed them out of the computer. You can't add words together, can you? Or can you? Let's find out. So we have word. Let's print word plus world. So now this is going to take the variable world and it's somehow going to add it to another string world. Let's see what happens. Save it, press up, press enter. It printed back hello world. So when you add strings together, it concatenates them to each other. So now we have hello world, but we don't have a space in there. So it doesn't really make sense. Can we add a space to this? Well, we have two options for doing this right now. There's many options, but I'm gonna show you two of them. We could add a space here, save it, go back to the terminal, press up, enter, and we get hello space world. So that'll work. Or if we wanted to keep our world in there, we could add an empty string in there. It should be hello empty string world. Save it, up, enter, hello space world. Nice job, and that's it for now. I'll see you next time.